Thanks everyone for joining us. We'll be starting in just a minute. We're gonna let folks join the session here. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us. And hello, my name is Jen. I work with the OpenDDS team and the OpenDDS Foundation. We are pleased to have Dr. Justin Wilson. He is a principal software engineer at OCI here with us today. And today he is going to be talking to us about using OpenDDS's RTPS relay and how that connects to IoT and IoT applications. So we are going to be doing a live Q&A session at the end, and we'll answer as many questions as we can as time allows. If you would please put those questions in the Q&A application part, portion, and you'll see that at the bottom of the screen. If you are more than welcome to use the chat feature to um, ask us things, it will help us though if you put your questions in the Q&A so we can keep track of those. Um, the chat is rolling, so it's easier for us to to make sure that we get all of your questions answered. So um, I believe that that is it as far as housekeeping things. So uh, Justin, I will go ahead and, oh, you know what? Let me go ahead first though and cover a few upcoming events. Um, we do have some online training classes coming up in October that we hope to see you all for. Um, we have open introduction to open EDS programming for Java and C++, uh, building open EDS applications with DDS security, and then the following week, we have OpenDDS Essentials and OpenDDS Essentials 2. You can always see upcoming uh, classes and then view up or view our entire course catalog for middleware. And we have the link dropped in there. So definitely check back often because we have classes that we will put on the schedule throughout the year. So we do look forward to you joining um other webinars that we'll schedule and then other training events that we'll put on like i said throughout throughout the course of the year so um i think that that is it for me now this time so <laughs> go ahead justin thank you so much all right thanks jen so um we'll start uh with kind of the motivation for the rtps relay why it exists i will then look at the design and how it operates and then we'll get more into uh using it or can uh and configuring it monitoring it uh so on and so forth and then finally we'll look at a brief list of gotchas that can bite you if you're trying to um, use the rtps relay so what's the motivation so in a in a typical iot scenario there's a device uh, that's typically a, a you know a consumer consumer grade device 
Uh, there's often a mobile application or perhaps a web application, uh, but that device is connected to the user's home network. Uh, so it's behind some kind of uh, consumer grade router. Uh, the mobile application is going to roam around, so it might be on Wi-Fi, it might be on cellular data, so on and so forth. And uh, between these two uh, two entities is the internet. And what we would like to do is uh, provide access, uh, both control and monitoring, uh, to the mobile application, so that the the user can manipulate uh, and monitor the device of interest whether it be a thermostat or a refrigerator or home security or what have you. Uh, the industrial scenario on the right is similar, except that uh, the device is typically placed behind an enterprise router, um, as the device is probably uh, in some kind of manufacturing uh, scenario or, or something like that. Uh, the application may or may not be mobile anymore. Uh, most likely it's probably more of uh, a web application that's running uh, in some kind of corporate inter uh, intranet or running on the internet, uh, perhaps in the cloud itself. So those are the scenarios uh, that we're looking at. Uh, and we can kind of settle on the IoT scenario as, as representative of, of what we're trying to accomplish. So in terms of open DDS and DDS, we want our devices and applications to be DDS participants. We'd like to use the open DDS middleware to uh, exchange data between uh, our device and application. When we consider this, uh, we'll just settle on the RTPS protocol for uh, establishing connectivity. So RTPS stands for real-time publish subscribe. Uh, it's an OMG standard. Uh, it's a UDP protocol that gives us interoperability uh, so that you can write applications using uh, different DDS implementations. It gives us security and it gives us X types, which uh, allows flexible message definitions and forward and backwards compatibility. Uh, I won't necessarily get into a whole lot more detail of the RTPS. We'll look at a little bit more of it. But uh, the main obstacle that we want to, uh, or the main characteristic of RTPS rather, is how discovery works. So discovery works by using multicast to advertise an IP address that a peer can use to contact a participant. This is done in two phases. One is, is uh, SPDP, simple participant discovery. Uh, and what, the other one is SCDP. SPDP always uses multicast um, to advertise uh, an address. And uh, every peer must then use that advertised uh, IP address to contact that participant. So that leads us to our pro some problems immediately. First, multicast doesn't work over the public internet. So there's no way for the uh, device to send an SPDP message to the application using a multicast channel because it's just not gonna work. Uh, the second problem is that there's no stable public IP address to advertise. Uh, the IP address of the, the NAT firewall router on both sides can uh, change. Uh, and especially given that the application part can be mobile, its public IP address might change during the session. Uh, so there's not a stable public IP address to advertise. And then finally, there's no direct connectivity. So even if the device could advertise its local address, it would just be advertising its local address, not the public address of the NAT firewall. Uh, or it would be advertising its public address as seen by the internet. So um we have a problem there in terms of of uh there's a number of issues that would prevent rtps discovery from working as is uh in the public internet so to establish connectivity we would like to introduce some kind of component that we'll call the rtps relay to connect these two dds participants so our problem statement is to create a horizontally scalable service called RTPS Relay that can forward RTPS messages between connected participants. And we'd like to expose this service on the internet uh, to allow participants without direct connectivity to communicate. In this case, we can put them behind different firewalls and routers and so on and so forth, and they can get to this common endpoint and that should allow them to exchange messages. And furthermore, we'd like to have no modifications to the RTPS protocol. Uh, so we would we don't want to uh, introduce some kind of custom extension or something that would break uh, interoperability in a strange way. So 
a slight refresher on uh, RTPS. So first is that uh, a list of partitions can be associated with a publisher subscriber. Uh, partition is just a string uh, that, that defines kind of a logical subset of an application. And we're going to use partitions extensively uh, in, the, in the relay for routing. SPDP stands for Simple Participant Discovery Protocol. And uh, participants are identified by a unique 12-byte string called the GUID prefix. And all RTPS messages contain this 12-byte uh, GUID prefix. ACDP stands for Simple Endpoint Discovery Protocol. An endpoint corresponds to a writer or publication or a reader slash subscription. An endpoint is identified by the GUID prefix plus four bytes. Uh, we aren't necessarily interested in that, the endpoint identifier uh, typically uh, in this talk. RTPS messages can contain zero or more InfoDesk sub-messages that contain the GUID prefix of the intended recipient. So this is important in the cases where one participant wants to send a message directly to another participant, the protocol encodes that information uh, that the RTPS relay could potentially use uh, to route messages between the different participants. So let's look at the design of, a, of the RTPS relay and we'll first consider a single instance of, of, uh, of the RTPS relay. So starting at the bottom actually is our client participant. This is the mobile app or the device. It sends RTPS messages to a component called the vertical handler. Uh, the vertical handler uh, is actually replicated three different times, one for SPDP, another for SCDP, and then another for the actual data that the uh, participant would be sending. The vertical participant uh, can make a forwarding decision and send messages to the horizontal handler, uh, and these are used to send messages to different instances. So we'll talk more about this in a subsequent slide. Uh, when we look at horizontal scalability. The application participant is a uh, DDS participant that is running in the client participant's domain. So what that means is it can discover the client participants and um, uh, do discovery with them. And we're going to use this uh, ability to learn something about the client participants so that we can form a routing table. Uh, after we do this discovery and discover their publications and subscriptions and their corresponding partitions, we can build a routing table that uh, by sending that to what's a component called the relay participant. The relay participant uh, is in a separate domain than the application participant, and it gossips routing table and other information to other RTPS relay instances. In terms of horizontal scaling, uh, this is the way it's organized in the sense that the horizontal handlers from one instance are connected to the horizontal handlers from the other. They're sending UDP messages, much like the vertical handler, and they're replicated three times as well. And then we have our relay participant, which is gossiping information uh, that's uh, about uh, RTPS relay instances and other things as well. Um, we'll get to that when we look at uh, configuration and monitoring. Uh, some other topics that they're they're uh, publishing, but that's the the general organization, and we can continue to extend this, you know, horizontally uh, as much as we need to. Uh, and they the RTPS relay instances form uh, a mesh or a click uh, of peers, and that's what allows them to forward messages to one uh, between client participants. So. One of the things to keep in mind when using that is that the RTPS relay is an open DDS application. Uh, so it's first of all running the application participant, which again is a DDS participant in the same domain. It securely discovers readers and writers and the partitions, that is if you're using security, which you should be uh, if you're operating on the public internet. It's gonna use this information to build a local routing table. So it knows that this client uh, is, has uh, an interest in this partition. And it's gonna aggregate all of its partitions and send those to other uh, relay participants. So um, if I'm interested in partition A, B, and C, all the other relay instances will know that I'm interested in A, B, and C, and any message relevant to A, B, and C will be sent uh, to me. 
The relay participant, again, is another DDS participant, but it's in a completely different domain, uh, and it's only used to talk to other uh, RTPS relay instances. Um, it does discover these instances using normal RTPS discovery, uh, and then it starts sharing partitions that are interested. Uh, it also does other things like sharing status information and statistics, which we'll cover later. So how does this work? So the first thing that an application does when using the RTPS relay is it does discovery with the RTPS relay, and that goes through two phases, uh, SPDP and SCDP. So the first thing that's going to happen is that the client participant sends its SPDP message to the vertical handler. The vertical handler is going to forward that message to the application participant. The application participant is going to respond with its SPDP message to the vertical handler. The vertical handler is going to then forward that message to the client participant, and then the client participant, at least the SPDP portion, uh, is complete. So now the client participant knows about the application participant. The application participant knows about the client participant. That leads to SCDP, where they start exchanging messages on the SCDP port. So again, the client participant is going to send an SCDP message to the vertical handler. Vertical handler forwards a message to the application participant. The application participant sends its own SCDP messages to the vertical handler, and the vertical handler forwards to client participant. At this point, endpoint discovery is complete, uh, and there's a number of SCDP endpoints, publishers, subscribers, uh, liveliness, et cetera. Uh, the application participant is really only interested in the publishers and subscribers. Uh, and the participant as, uh, as well. At this point, the RTPS really has all the information it needs. It knows the partitions, uh, it knows GUIDs and everything uh, so that it can start forwarding messages between client participants. Um, so I've, I've talked a little bit about routing tables, but what are they really? So the application participant is reading the built-in topics to record partitions that are associated with each publication and subscription. So it maps this in two ways. Uh, both a forward map from good prefix to partition. So whenever it receives a message from a client participant, it knows what partitions are, are relevant. And then there's also one that does partition to good prefix. So if it receives a message from another RTPS relay instance, it can, uh, with the partitions on it, it can know what good prefix uh, locally it needs to forward to. So the complete list of partitions is published to other instances via the relay participant. Uh, and each instance then builds a lookup table of partition to other instances. So when it gets a message and it knows the partitions, it can look up all the other relay instances that are um, interested in that and forward it on using the horizontal handlers. So now that we've completed uh, discovery with the application participant, the client participants start operating normally and interacting with others. So a client participant sends a message to the vertical handler. Uh, the vertical handler looks up partitions for the sending client participant, extracts any destination GUIDs that are present, looks up interesting instances using partition, using the partitions that it extracted, uh, then is going to prefix the RTPS message with routing information, such as the partitions and the destination GUIDs, and then it's going to send that to the horizontal handler of interested instances. The horizontal handler takes that prefixed message, strips off the partitions and the any destination GUIDs, and uses those to forward to any local, um, any local participant, any local client uh, that is either in one of those partitions or has one of those destination GUIDs. So, um, in keeping in mind that just some things to consider in the operation is that if a, if a uh, client participant sends an undirected SPDP message or SCDP message, that is one without an InfoDesk sub-message, uh, it's going to be forwarded to the application participant because it's one of the participants on that, uh, in that domain. And it's also going to be forwarded to everyone else uh, in that group of partitions. Um, there's an optimization to avoid sending to its own horizontal handler. Um, so basically, if, if, if the destination is connected to the same instance, it can forward it directly. It doesn't need to go through the entire process. Um, and the, finally, the, the most recent SPDP message for a client participant is cached and replayed when a new client participant is discovered in a shared partition. So what this 
does is it accelerates discovery by allowing that client to receive the SPDP message quicker instead of waiting on like a, a broadcast uh, from one of the client participants. However, this feature isn't, um, it doesn't work uh, robustly all the time and we'll, we'll remove it in a future release, at which point the client participant will just resend its SPDP messages whenever it connects to a relay instance. Another um, feature, I guess you could say, is that uh, the client participants periodically do connectivity checks with the RTPS relay. So the relay maintains a lookup table of uh, client participants and how they their um, IP, their public IP and port essentially that that they're using, and it'll keep three of them: one for SPDP, one for SEDP, and another one for the data. As the clients are sending, if they don't periodically send information, uh, then the NAT that they're behind will close that port um, to prevent incoming traffic that is unintended from reaching an application. So in order to keep uh, the ability of the relay to send information down to a client participant, we need that client participant to periodically send to the relay. Uh, so uh, that's what happens, and those connectivity checks are done using stun binding requests and stun binding indications. I won't go into the details of that here, but it's a simple UDP uh, protocol that has a request response mode and also an indication mode, which just uh, is used for keeping uh, these these uh, port bindings, is what they're called, alive. Uh, and the link to the IETF specification for it uh, is there for you to use. So the, uh, the RTBS really, as you might imagine, comes with a lot of uh, configuration options. Uh, I'm not necessarily gonna go into a whole lot of detail here, but I do wanna hit some of the, the high points. The first is that each one has an ID. This ID is used as a key um, in many of the topics that the relay participant publishes uh, so that you can identify which relay instance it is and also to you know, keep them unique. Um, the horizontal address and the vertical address uh, block can be uh, where you start, can be specified, obviously. You can configure the domain that the relay is in compared to the application. Uh, you can also give the application participants some user data, uh, and that's very useful when your uh, client uh, participant uh, is that you can, as you do discovery, you can actually see any information that is associated with that. Uh, RTPS relay instance. Uh, at a minimum, you can make it to where you can identify the RTPS relay and say, uh, yes, I've completed discovery with it. Uh, there's buffer size configurations for um, how many, uh, how the UDP uh, socket should work. Uh, lifespan is how long it's going to keep around those client participant IP port records. Um, so again, you can't necessarily keep those around forever, so those have to expire after a certain amount of inactivity. Uh, similarly, there's an inactive period, which uh, is typically shorter than your lifespan, where uh, you can use to set a smaller uh, period just to see if uh, the client participant has uh, its network connectivity is disrupted. Finally, there's, there's a flag that says you can allow empty partitions. Uh, allowing an empty partition is, is dangerous because um, a message sent to the in the empty partition will get forwarded to every single uh, participant. Uh, that may be what you want. That may not be what you want, depending on how you structure your application. Security-wise, it takes all the all of the um, security parameters that are necessary, mainly the six six files, the identity CA's uh, certificate, the permission CA certificate the identity certificate and key of the application participant, uh, the governance file that is shared and the permissions file. Uh, the permissions file doesn't have to have anything in it really, it just needs to have a valid permissions file uh, because the application participant doesn't create any uh, topics uh, and it doesn't create any readers or writers. Uh, also there's, if you're using security, you can use uh, a feature called restart detection. So if you have a, a client participant that's in some kind of uh, restarting uh, loop or crash loop or something like that, uh, you can detect that that's happening and that 
cleans up the records in the RTPS relay, uh, which makes the uh, memory performance a little bit better. Uh, and the way that works is there's, you can use a hash of the subject name uh, in the certificate that appears in the GUID. Uh, so you can use that hash to detect that the application has restarted um, and therefore you can take a corrective action. Uh, there's other, again, there's other options. So you configure logging. So if you wanna see warnings, um, you can log discovery messages. So as messages come in from the built-in topics and the applications participant, you can log those. Uh, you can also log uh, messages that concern the IP port mappings for clients. And both of those can be, are certainly helpful uh, when you're uh, debugging a system using the RTPS relay. And then the relay is collecting statistics. So it collects statistics on the relay as a whole. Uh, or the relay instance as a whole, rather, it collects statistics on specific handlers uh, to see how they're performing. And it also uh, can collect statistics on individual clients. And you have uh, the option to log these uh, as they're happening. And also you can publish them on uh, topics created by the relay participant, uh, which means you can create uh, an application that interacts with the RTPS relay uh, to gather these statistics and you can um, do uh, do whatever uh, business logic you'd like to with those. So the the logging um, is again there's there's a lot of logging that the the relay does. I just wanted to take you through a few examples um, so that as you see things uh, you kind of understand what's going on. So as you log um, discovery, uh, you'll see messages that come in from the bits. Uh, and they'll, the general format is that you'll have the GUID of the participant the, that was discovered or the publication or uh, whatever it is. And then you'll have the, the actual data sample from the built-in topic uh, printed in JSON format. In this particular case, we see this, this value is the GUID prefix, um, or, or sorry, is the actual GUID. Uh, in this particular case, we can see that the, there was user data, um, and these are these are byte strings, so they're encoded all as numbers, which isn't the most convenient thing, but uh, it is workable. And then you see a timestamp as to when discovery happened into the session. So from the time that this participant sent the first message, it was discovered in 0 0.005 seconds, five milliseconds. So that's an example of uh, discovery logging and there's similar ones for when a publication or subscription is discovered. The bottom set of messages relates to the, the IP port mappings. So uh, the first message is uh, essentially a, an announcement that this participant has sent a message to the RTPS relay and this is the very first one. Uh, the second message says that it, uh, this came from the, the SCDP port uh, and then it also gives you the binding. So in this particular case, I was running the RTPS relay smoke test and uh, the remote address was 127.001.50126. You then have uh, the idea of admission and I'll talk a little bit more about admission control in a moment, um, but essentially the client gets admitted uh, and then we see uh, the SPDP port uh, up here as well, and so on and so forth. So you would see a data one as well. So you can see, uh, you can kind of get the story for how a client participant connects uh, and how long certain operations take uh, with respect to discovery. Uh, for statistics, uh, again, there's a, there's a lot of information here. I don't necessarily uh, want to cover all of it, uh, but you do see this relay statistics as a, as a logged JSON object. Um, and you can see, uh, the ID given to the relay. Uh, you can see how many uh, messages came in in the time interval, how many messages left, how many bytes came in, how many bytes came out, how many participants are connected, how many new participants came, how many participants were uh, expired, and so on and so forth. Uh, similarly, for uh, participants, you see a JSON message and you see uh, kind of the total number of messages sent. Uh, to them, total number of bytes sent to them, so on and so forth. So there's a there's a lot of information there. So RTPS Relay also has configuration related to monitoring. The 
uh, the first one is you can log thread status. So there is thread monitoring implemented in the RTPS relay. Uh, so if you turn this option on, it will log out uh, the thread status uh, as, uh, as it checks the thread status. And the thread status essentially contains the name of the thread and the utilization. The thread status safety factor is there to restart. Um, it'll essentially abort the application if the thread, if you enable thread monitoring and the, the, um, a thread has not checked in for this many reporting intervals. Uh, so if you, uh, if you are concerned about the RTPS relay locking up, then you can use this to restart it, uh, which uh, is useful. There's also a utilization limit. So if you have the thread monitoring enabled, you can also set a utilization limit, which uh, will cause the RTPS relay to ignore client participants until the utilization comes below a certain threshold, which is the utilization limit. That's important for situations where you're restarting under load. So if you have a bunch of client participants that are out there uh, configured to use a re RTPS relay instance and you decide to restart that RTPS relay instance, it's going to try to do discovery with potentially hundreds or thousands of client participants um, almost immediately. So by putting using this utilization limit, you can uh, you can prevent uh, starting some discoveries until some other ones are complete. Uh, and you can essentially, shorten the amount of uh, time to complete those discoveries by by limiting them um, using this utilization limit. So that's a very useful feature for uh, production deployments. Uh, this other, the, the feature publishing relay status liveliness uh, is the, um, it uses the liveliness quas uh, on the relay status. And this just sets the uh, amount of time that is used in that liveliness clause. The option after that, which is publish relay status, publishes uh, a status indicating whether it's accepting or not. And you can use that, uh, again, for whatever purpose you want. We found it useful for uh, building uh, a load balancer in front uh, that allows, um, essentially, if this relay is is so busy and overwhelmed, new client participants can be directed to um, a, a different one. Um, so again, here's an example of if you want to log the thread status, uh, the, the first part of the thread ID is, uh, again, the name of a thread. In this case, it was the main thread in the RTPS relay. And you can see what its uh, kind of a, a approximate utilization was in terms of percentage of his, uh, for a fraction of a CPU. And then you can see the, the rest is just a DDS sample info that, that tells you that this instance uh, is alive. Um, so all throughout this presentation, I've talked about this relay participant publishing various topics. So uh, on this slide, I really just wanna go through what is available and um, in some sense, if you want to write an application that interacts with an RTPS relay, these are the things that are available to you. So first is a relay partition. So the relay partitions are, is a topic that is used for the RTPS relay instance to say, I'm, I have clients that are in these partitions. Relay addresses is a, a topic where the relay can say, these are where my horizontal, um, my horizontal uh, handlers are located. So that allows other relay instances to know where to forward the uh, horizontal messages to. Relay status uh, indicates if it's admitting new client participants. So again, that's pretty much, if you don't have the, the, the utilization and the, utils the threshold set, uh, that's always going to be true. Um, if you do set those, then the relay status will become dynamic and it'll indicate if it's if it is admitting. Relay participant status uh, is a is a topic that publishes uh, two bits and uh, the user data for a client participant. So the alive is based on um, that lifespan um, configuration value. So it'll be true if messages are coming in, when messages stop coming in. Um, alive will go to false. Uh, active is similar, except it's used on the, the inactive threshold. 
And then finally, you get the user data for client participants. So this can be very useful um, if you would like to see what, uh, what client participants are out there uh, that the RTPS re has discovered. You can build an application that subscribes to this topic. Uh, you can render that out, and then you can use that for you know, whatever business purposes. Again, that's that's been a very useful feature in uh, in some of the deployments we've done of the RTPS relay. Uh, there's the SPDP replay topic, uh, which is effectively when a new client participant is discovered, uh, sends a replay request that says, "If you're in this partition, please send me the SPDP messages uh, for that uh, that you have that are are relevant to that partition." And again, that speeds up discovery. But again, that, that's going to go away in a future release at some point. Um, you then have the participant statistics, uh, which are, uh, again, the, the messaging statistics for particular participants, and then similarly for the handler and the relay as well. So moving on to kind of configuring it, um, the the RTPS relay itself uh, is configured like another any other DDS application. Typically, you're going to use an INI file, um, or rather, you, you kind of have to use an INI file to to configure it. Um, and there's two there's two domains you have to configure. You have to configure the application domain, and you have to configure the the relay domain. Um, in this particular config file, we've enabled the thread status monitoring because we'd like to do admission control. Um, our domain one is for the relay participant, so we have set up uh, various discovery options that work. Uh, some of the discovery options here, such as check source IP, are necessary for cloud. If you want to deploy it in the cloud, similarly, multicast doesn't work, so you need to disable that. Um, and also, you need to set typically set a, a max message size um, because the uh, the cloud may not support uh, large frames. And similarly, the, the transport config is uh, essentially saying very similar things. For the application participant, uh, it's in domain zero. It similarly is disabling a source IP check, uh, disabling multicast because we know it's not going to work. Uh, but we then configure the vertical handlers. So in this particular case, we're always going to talk to our local vertical handler. We're going to set a flag called RTPS relay only because all of the traffic we send should go through the relay. And then we configure various things about message sizes and um, how often we want to resend our SPDP. Um, resending SPDP from the application participant is interesting. So typically, a participant has a periodic timer where it resends its SPDP message. In an RTPS relay instance, it could be associated with thousands or tens of thousands of client participants. And it doesn't really make sense to periodically send 10,000 messages out. So uh, the RTPS relay participant, or the application participant, sorry, is going to typically be configured with undirected SPDP zero, meaning it's always going to send a directed SPDP message. And we're going to make that periodic. So instead of sending them all on some interval, we take that interval and we split it up and we send a few uh, throughout uh, time so that periodically we get to everybody, but we don't necessarily do them all at once. And then the final configuration parameters here are, are tuning the way SCDP works and buffer sizes and so on. So to use the RTPS relay, and this is if you're a client participant, how are you going to configure it? So first, in the RTPS relay or the RTPS discovery sections in a config file, you have SPDP RTPS relay address and SCDP RTPS relay address. So those configure that I would like to send discovery messages to the relay in addition uh, so that I can use it uh, in the transport side. Uh, for the RTPS UDP transport, there's data RTPS relay address, which sets the, the third data port. Uh, there are corresponding settings available via the RTPS discovery API if you're not using a config file and you'd like to do that, uh, and the RTPS UDP transport API. Uh, these can be changed at any time. So uh, that is, is useful from a load balancing perspective. So if a client participant 
figures out that it is not connected to an RTPS relay, it can uh, find a different instance and then dynamically change these and then it can start using a different RTPS relay instance. There are some custom built-in topics that are related to the RTPS relay. The first is the participant location topic. And this has uh, a list of remote participants and it has some flags indicating how they're reachable. Uh, two of those flags are dedicated to the RTPS relay, one for IPv4 and one for IPv6. Um, and this indicates that, that, that the local participant has received messages from the relay that appeared to be from this, uh, that remote participant. So that gives you some idea that you may, be connect, uh, you may be talking to them through the relay or at least talking to them through the relay as possible. Um, if they're instead a local one, that is you've received a message from them using a local address, um, it will attempt to optimize that and send it directly Lo uh, locally instead of using the relay, as it would just be more efficient that way. The other uh, custom built-in topic is called the connection record topic. And this contains, uh, this is kind of a generalization of the participant location topic. It's, it's not necessarily a uh, complete replacement yet, uh, though eventually it will be. Uh, but the idea here is that uh, there are certain uh, connect connection records uh, that we can, uh, that you can use to monitor connections. So in this particular case, uh, the, the, uh, the type is, um, sorry, the protocol rather, is RTPS relay stun. So as we're doing connectivity checks with the RTPS relay, uh, we can publish that information uh, in this connection record topic. So you would see uh, both the SPDP uh, in this particular case, it's port 4444, which is to the left of the protocol. Um, you would see also one for the CDP uh, as it's doing these connectivity checks and publishing these connectivity records or connect, yeah, connection records. Um, there's also reported latency. So you can measure the latency, uh, the round trip latency that a stun connectivity check is taking. Uh, so that in this particular case, that was uh, 1.3 milliseconds. Um, so again, this is running locally and it's very fast. Uh, realistically, that's going to be more, but uh, that allows the a client participant to uh, measure its connectivity to the RTPS relay. So there's some there's some things to keep in mind if you're using the RTPS relay or designing an application with it first you have to keep partitions in mind. So um, the partitions are used by the RTPS relay to do efficient message routing. If you don't use partitions, um, you, it's basically degrading into uh, multicast and uh, it's the, the performance is going to suffer um, consequently. That may not be important if an application is small enough, but uh, as it scales out, uh, it becomes important. Another problem you're going to face is bootstrapping the relay participants. So um, cloud environments are notorious for not supporting multicast. Uh, and since those are uh, RTPS, you, is it, so those are using RTPS discovery, you have to figure out a way of, of getting around that. Um, and typically that involves something that's going to emulate multicast. Uh, and there is a, a tool called the multicast repeater that we wrote uh, for for doing this, and there's there's references to that later. Uh, use DDS security with with restart detection is definitely recommended. Um, using the thread monitoring with admission control is definitely recommended because you're going to restart under load. Uh, you need to be aware that that firewalls block UDP messages, so monitoring connection records and using the RTPS relay logging can diagnose problems uh, with this. Um, firewalls close ports periodically after they're not used. So you need to ensure that stun uh, connectivity checks are frequent enough to keep those ports open. Um, and another thing to consider is that IP fragmentation is not globally supported. Um, so if, as IP fragmentation happens, um, it's often the case that the first fragment might get through, whereas the, second, the subsequent fragments may not. 
So this means uh, that you need to configure fragmentation at the RTPS level so that IP fragmentation doesn't concern, doesn't occur. Uh, so this means setting a conservative enough threshold to, to force RTPS to fragment the message so that IP fragmentation won't happen and your messages won't get dropped. So with that, um, I'll open it up to questions now. Uh, again, the RTPS relay is, is a horizontally scalable service that allows you to connect DDS participants uh, across the internet. Um, it's based on partitions, although you don't necessarily have to use them, but uh, it is recommended. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll take questions. Thanks, Justin. Um, I'm looking here at the Q&A and I don't see any now, but um, we'll give everyone a chance to digest all of that and um, put some questions up here in the Q&A while you take a, take a drink there and um, a little break. Um, we will hang around here for another Another minute or so if anyone has to go we do thank you for your time this morning for joining us and um like i said before do keep a lookout for any upcoming events we do have scheduled um and check back with us often for webinars and training coming up and um he's advanced here so you can see um some interesting articles that we have um as references and um yeah so please feel free to um throw up some questions justin will be around here to answer those and if you do have to go thanks again for your time slide 29 shows that the clients need to be configured with address of a relay assuming there's more than one relay in turning how should they determine the address of one to connect to so that is a great question. So the um, the first uh, reference here, this designing a secure cloud-enabled peer-to-peer IoT application, has uh, a high-level architecture for dealing with that. And what uh, the the architecture that that we've seen work is to um, co-locate an HTTP server with each RTPS relay instance then load balancing can happen through the http interface so essentially when a when a client participant starts it can make an http request uh, that http request be load balanced uh, to find an rtps relay instance that would return the configuration that is necessary and then the rtp the the client participant would would use that configuration um, you can do a lot of neat things with that uh, you can connect the the uh, our relay status topic to that, which um, would would make the the load balancer avoid RTPS relay instances that are overloaded and, and so on and so forth. Um, to that end, uh, a feature that we just added, and I mean just added, is uh, the ability to to host that HTTP server in the RTPS relay instance itself. Uh, we're, we call that the meta discovery server. Um, that effectively gives you a, a way to um, advertise kind of whatever you want uh, to the to a client. Um, and that uh, is also um, hooked into the the uh, status that that admitting status so that if it is overloaded, it won't it'll uh, return an appropriate HTTP status to make the load balance or avoid it. Um, so uh, the 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 instance side support um, is there, and and I'll I'll probably write an article on it uh, very shortly. Um, the the piece that's not quite there yet is the client side support, and and that's uh, somewhat of a client specific or an application specific uh, issue. Um, but but we are uh, adding support on the server side for it. um the slideshow login example seemed to be using a json format why was that format selected what are the best practices for using json with opends uh, another good question so um the 
uh, JSON was really selected based on um, the uh, ability of a lot of um, log analytics tools to process JSON. So by encoding portions, at least of, of logging messages, those can be automatically parsed and searchable. Uh, which is a very useful feature when you're you're trying to debug or monitor something. Um, so that's why JSON was selected. Uh, JS OpenDDS does come with support for that. So if you enable the rapid JSON uh, support, um, you can uh, basically serialize any IDL defined uh, type um, or a core type. Uh, so, you know, struct and things like that, structs uh, and, and the primitives um, to JSON. And that's that's what the RTPS relay is doing. Uh, it's taking the the uh, data types that are defined by the built-in topics and serializing them in that way and, and logging them out. So um, in terms of best practices, I I don't necessarily have a lot of them other than if you want something logged, you can can define it in IDL, uh, and then you can uh, use that the the two JSON helper to render that as a JSON string. All right. Thanks, Justin. Um, I'm looking, I'm not seeing any others at the moment. Um, so we've got a few more minutes till the top of the hour. So um, if anyone else has any other questions, um, we will wait just a minute, another minute or so and uh, hang out just in case. Justin, do you want to advance? I think there might be um, another slide that has some resources and other on-demand webinars in case people are looking for any other content that they might want to reference. Right. So these are um, these are articles specific to the RTPS relay and and using OpenDDS on the internet. Uh, the next slides are kind of general OpenDDS resources. Um, and I think there's maybe one more, which are even more general. Uh, those are just uh, websites for the project itself, um, source repo, again, our, our support and training and so on. And then our most recent release is 321. Uh, and you can uh, read about it uh, on GitHub. Great, thank you so much. All right, well, if that is it for everyone and I'm not seeing any more questions, I think we can go ahead and wrap for today and give everybody a few minutes back before, before their next thing here at 11 o'clock. So thanks again for everyone for joining us and we will see you next time. Thanks, Justin.